good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to talk in my capacity as a computer scientist uh, on innovation. And I think that being trained in computer science gives us certain skills, and I'd like to talk about that today. So complex systems are all around us. And I go back to my proper slide. These systems have evolved over time, over uncounted millennia. And they have structure, they have function, they have behavior. But increasingly today, we are designing even more complicated infrastructures, telecommunications, power systems, computing devices. And I think we can learn something from the way that biology has evolved over millions and billions of years to attend to that task. Now, when I look at a complex system, what I try to understand is what its function is, like a clicker function. And to focus on this, we start with the fact that every system has a specification. Every system has a model, the realization of that system, and then finally, what it actually appears like in practice. Now, the first inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, decided he'd want to talk remotely to another human. So it was a simple wire connecting two rooms. Eventually, that increased in complexity to what we now know today, but ultimately, there's still a realization of that system that had to first be envisioned by someone. You might have a need to govern a country. So you design a model framework, and then that would be your constitution. And then it actually has to be carried out and realized by people fulfilling different roles in the 109th Congress over there. Y you may look at life and say, well, is there really a specification for a bald eagle? Do we really need something to depopulate the salmon from a stream? Well, in fact, the model of that bird of prey is now stored in DNA. And so I can look at that as a model and try to understand through all these systems that no matter what happens in a complex system, they need to innovate to not only sustain themselves, but to thrive. And so we need to do a little history. And in computer science, I don't get a chance to do this much, so bear with me. About three billion years ago, life formed on this planet. And at the time, we now know those to be prokaryotic cells, very simple unicellular organisms. They might form colonies and form associations with other entities, but as in all, rather simple life. At some point, about a billion years later, came the eukaryotes. And they share so much in common, it's really intriguing from someone outside of the biological field, uh, looking at it more from a point of view of information and structure to see how much they have in common. And of course, there are differences. Uh, some primary ones are the scale, 10 to 100 times larger, the nucleus, uh, and other specialized functions. And there are many theories as to how this actually happened. I prefer the anti-symbiotic formation theory that somehow suggests that these prokaryotic cells, forming close association with each other, somehow became symbiotic. And they formed tighter relationships between themselves so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so one would think, well, this looks great. Now that we have the basis for multicellular organisms with increased specialization, everything should start to take off now, and we should see the great diversity in life that we have today. Unfortunately, it didn't exactly happen. And it had to wait to a certain point in time, which we know to be the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago. And you might read about this in the scientific literature or the Scientific American. The way I found it was by Stephen Jay Gould, which any book that he writes is fine by me. Um, and in there, he describes this period in time where about 90% of the life as we know it on this planet was in this model of single cellular life. And so what was it? What had to happen for that multicellular life to somehow take root and form these incredible diversities? Well, they have theories, as scientists do. Uh, and I'm going to look at this one for today's talk as sort of a basis for modularity and why it plays such an important role in innovation. Somehow at that time, within 50 to 70 million years, all the major phylum on the planet seemed to evolve, the earliest ancestors. And the diverse life forms are incredible. They even have an animal here called hallucinogenic. They couldn't understand what it was. And at that time, the best theory as to what exactly happened is that somehow the emergence of all these multicellular organisms introduced a change context, and the scale changed just enough, we've heard earlier this concept of a tipping point, and I think it's appropriate here, that these novel physical processes appeared where before there was just regulation of genes for unicellular functions, now took over in an interesting product way, not just additive, but true products to form interesting new uh, processes. And so the morphological complexity that you see, uh, appendages, layers, segments, all appeared from self-organization. And so you have an incredible diversity where it's true that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. To return to a modern context, which is where I find myself more, uh, I now need to talk about what a module is. Now, modules are in software, they're in hardware, but they also are more abstract, as we'll come to see. 
So we'll just say that a module is some unit of functionality that has a well-defined interface with this context. So I'll take a very simple example of Windows. Every window is functional. You can open it or close it. It has certain structure, what its elements are. It has the behavior. It illuminates the room, but it could also be used as a fire escape if you had to. Although the, the 14th century window there is probably not a good fire escape. Um, and in fact, it has certain elements that they have. And if I look at that rather simple system, I try to identify its functionality, structure, behavior. And that window in the Gothic church has certain physical properties that's embedded in the wall. Uh, and that's very different from the more modern window you see there. And so modules themselves are just these units. And so what I'm really looking at is what are the good properties of module that really change it and make it something that leads to innovation. So I've broken these up into three groupings. We first start with this notion that if you have a true module, it can be independently constructed and then replaced at will, either by a new version from the manufacturer or a third party upstart that tries to replace it. You might have extensibility, which we now know as add-ons, or there's an app for that. And you could also think about some modules that were developed in one context, and you want to use it in a totally different context that you would never envisioned. And if you look at these two little window examples, um, the window in the Gothic church really comes up poor in all these rankings. It's not replaceable. Uh, it's not extensible. There's not much you can do with it. But the modern window has all these really nice features. And while the one thing that both fail on is this notion of taking a window and using it in another context, um, we will see examples where that actually is the case. And so what I like to do is to turn to the biology world again to start with this notion that what we really have are three distinct themes that we've seen in our textbooks. We'll start with adaptation, the ability to acquire a trait. And that's just like a third party add-on. And then if that trait gets absorbed into a population, now you have true evolution. We've replaced certain modules across uh, a wider sphere. And finally, this last notion of exaptation, which is this idea that something developed for one purpose can be taken over for use for another. You may at least be familiar with the evolution of dinosaurs and birds. It turns out that many believe that bird feathers were actually heat regulation devices, and then eventually they became used for flight. Again, a totally different purpose, but one that nature took very good use of. And so when I think about these things, uh, let's go back to genetics. So we go to 1865, a monk in Brno in Czech Republic who's working on his, uh, his hereditary ideas. And so he can understand that he can pass certain traits from one generation to the next, peas in this case, through successive breeding regimens where he has a certain organism, the cultivar on the top right, top, and he's got these certain beneficial genes he's trying to pass on. Of course, at the time, he had no notion that there were genes or chromosomes. He had this idea that there were traits somehow being passed on. He could observe them without understanding the mechanism or the function. And through successive breeding programs, you can indeed have a desired cultivar that you would get in the lower right-hand corner. Or you could take the modern route. Biotechnology shows that we can use agrobacterium to transplant DNA sequences into another organism. This is the basis of GMOs and genetically modified organisms. And so with a very quick turnaround period, you can take a beneficial gene that was used in one totally different context and inject it into an organism, an entire different one, and yet you get the same result. All this is based on the concept of modularity. And without this basis, there's no way that I believe life would be able to adapt and evolve because it's a fundamental belief in chromosomes that the modules are themselves genes. But we can also look at that from a point of view of a macro perspective. Um, when you hear about uh, organ transplants, my first thought is, well, they're just hacking the body. They, they didn't know what they were doing when they were doing an, an organ transplant. They just said, I wonder if it's possible. And every time I see a, a heart transplant, which seems so common now, you look at what's really happening. And I never understood how they could do it, because I was envisioning all these nerve attachments that they had to reattach. But it turns out the human heart has no external nerves. You just plug it in and then watch it work. And so they understood the interface of that module, and they were able to take advantage of it to actually introduce third party replacements. And of course, uh, external add-ons, like having a dialysis pump or even a, a, an automatic lung, everything that the biologists are doing now with this incredibly rich stuff can be seen as just, I'm going to hack the body. I'm going to find a way to take this advantage, advantage of this module and introduce this as well. So that modularity can both be at the micro model level, but also at the physical level, the, the larger system. And in fact, I believe innovation has to happen at all three levels. Otherwise, you can't actually see why you're trying to do the things you're doing. But that's the specification. Just imagine every time you learn a solitaire game, someone said, oh, this game of solitaire is just like Klondike, except you do this. So you've got the basic strategy. Well, I've got my understanding. I'm just going to tweak some of the rules, treat them like a module, cut them out, and put something else in its place. Or the Constitution, 
you can just amend it just with a lot of work, but you can do it. And then you now have a new module that's attached to the greater whole. Uh, in the actual physical systems, we can, of course, replace function units all the time. And again, going back to telecommunications, for the last 40, 50 years, you could still take a regular coax uh, plug of a phone and plug into the wall, and you could still have access to this interconnected uh, global network, even though the actual handset hadn't changed much. And what it, what it shows me is that when you're looking at a system of any capacity, any level of, of hierarchy, you can find modules that themselves are broken down. And possibly, it could be a very complex system itself. But if I treat it like a module, then I don't have to worry about those complexities. And so this principle of modularity does extend all the way throughout the entire system that you're working on. So the basic premise of my talk today is, while modularity may not be the basis for innovation, it certainly is a one. And, and if I take, as we now know, there's a term called biomimesis, bi biomimesis, I believe, which is try to mimic what nature does. And so if you look at what's understanding in the world, how things are built, well, let's go back to my description of what happened in the Cambrian time, and now take it up to a modern context. Now we're building systems for modules, each one of which is incredibly complicated. And it's a changed context now on a spatial scale we'd never envisioned. Global communications uh, and power systems that are now interconnected. And these novel computational processes are in fact made possible because you have all these functioning modules that are being assembled in ways that they might never have been envisioned before. And so the morphological complexity, all these different mobile apps, web servers, uh, mainframe computers are all taking advantage of the fact that they have these great powerful modules to do their work. And so I don't have time to go into all of these, but I'll just pick some of these. The, the main innovation that comes up is called, well, when you take a complex system, but in the future, it's just a module. And so you can kind of see that the paradigm of innovation is constantly moving in that direction. Once you have a well-defined interface, as we talk about in our discipline, you can create all these uh, economies of scale. Just think of all the people who are trying to write an iPhone app once the interface is defined, or prior to that, a Facebook app. The second part of innovation that can be described here is the systems, the software that is being written. And traditionally, as a computer scientist, I grew up writing software on my own computer. And then eventually, you realized you could expand it to the world because of the internet. And now you made it available for anyone to download and license. It used to be the case that hardware manufacturers gave away the software because they wanted you to buy the hardware. Well, now they give away the hardware so that they can license you the software. And as software became more and more complex, it developed into this interesting area called the software stack. You may have heard of the term. It's nothing more than a, a set of software that comes pre-installed that has minimal external dependencies and provides a substantial function that you can then take and work with without having to just reinvent the wheel from scratch. And this gives unprecedented productivity to our software vendors. I'm going to talk about one of these you at least should at least be aware of. Every time you go to a website and you buy something in the shopping cart, you're probably using a LAMP software stack. That company has probably built a web server that's running on top of a machine that's using the Linux operating system freely available. And they use maybe the Apache web server to host those requests. They need to store the data. So they put it into a database, but they don't want to buy one. They'll just get the freely available one, MySQL. And they need to do some dynamic web pages. So they're not going to buy something. They'll just program it in Perl or Python. PHP. And so these individual systems were not envisioned for this. This wasn't the exogenesis of some long-standing idea. They were all individual projects that just kind of grew up all at the same time, matured at the same time. And before you knew it, you had this really interesting, I'm going to say, symbiotic relationship where they're all powerful, but they make the whole even more interesting and powerful as it goes forward. And so this leads me to try to tie together these two parts of my talk one that goes back a billion years and one that's only 10 years old. So in, in the biological sciences, there are these domains. That's what I remember from eighth grade. And so you could have the archaea and the bacteria. Those are the prokaryotes. And then you got the eukarya. Those are the eukaryotes. And they've got all these great things going back to Linnaeus and even earlier, the phylum and the kingdom. And it's really almost romantic. So in my mind, I'm going to propose, let's have another domain. We'll call it computaria. And it represents all of software. And in this domain, there are different kingdoms. I know about Unixia. That's all the software that's developed on a Linux platform. And don't forget Mobilia. That's where all the handheld devices are, Palm Pilots, PDAs, Apple iPhones. And so in the future, perhaps not the not too distant future, we may have paleocomputologists, much like our paleontologists now, trying to go through the forensic record and really try to understand, well, what is that lamp that was there? Why was it so important? Why did so many uh, people use it? And they may say, well, that's actually a phylum, Lampia, in the Unixia kingdom. And it's not too far off from the truth, because 
if I go back to the Cambrian period again, where the core dates evolved somewhere around about the 540 million mark, they developed this architecture, which is a, a body plan that had you know, bilateral uh, model, and then you've got a head and tail, rudimentary vertebrae, and this whole thing, it's a very incredibly diverse species, of course, but only 4% are chordates in this. And you can see the vertebrae coming out of that, the reptiles, the poor little mammals over there who kind of come out and dominate, as we now know today. And so when I look at the chordates, I see the chordate phylum stack. This is the way that you would engineer an animal if you had all these parts. And so I wanted to leave you at least with one thing because sometimes innovation is a hard thing to capture. How do, you, how do you innovate? Well, Daniel Parnas in our discipline has identified the following. When you're trying to find a module or create a module, you should instead think about separating a module that already exists. Find a way to separate it up into two parts so that the module A is actually simpler because you separated stuff out into B, and module B is not necessarily more complicated. And yet, you can envision using B in a totally different context, and now you've got two modules where before you had one. True innovation is what I would say. And so I'll leave you with my final premise as I start at the beginning. Modularity is the key to innovation. And with that, uh, you can do anything that you can imagine. Thank you very much.